All right, I'm gonna give a quick welcome. Um, we're just gonna still keep letting everybody in, but this is exciting. <laughs> so hello everybody, my name is Teresa Gage, Assistant Director of Alumni and Alumni Relations here at Hobart and William Smith. I'm delighted to spend this Saturday evening with you. <laughs> and my quick look into this crowd and our registrations, we have um, some couples doing a date night. That's, I love that. There are some families and parents of current students. Um, and there's also some groups of friends. I, uh, I have a feeling we're gonna be hearing some uh, stories about our uh, host tonight, class of 91. <laughs> But thank you. We're not rated. <laughs> but thank you for joining us tonight. Um, before we do get into a little bit of the housekeeping, um, why don't you go ahead, if you haven't already, and open your bottles of wine. And we'll give that um, a few minutes for them to breathe uh, while we're getting started. You can go ahead and open your bottles. If you haven't drank half of them already, we'd understand. Just save some. <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and get started with this evening with Jim Cissery, Hobart class of 1991, same as my husband. <laughs> and he is the owner of Finger Lakes Goods here in Geneva. We are going to hear about his entrepreneurial pursuits and some more stories about how he is leveraging our regional resources here. Dan Mitchell, Director of Sales at Fox Run Winery. He will be here leading our tasting this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this program over to these two gentlemen and everybody enjoy. Awesome, thanks Teresa. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. This is Jim Cissery here, as Teresa said, class of 91. Um, and her husband, David, not only did we graduate uh, at the same time, we also went to high school together. Uh, so I think with Dave and his Hobart, I think the one thing that's been cool coming back to Geneva has just been sort of realigning very closely, much more closely with the colleges uh, and working with them on great programs like this, uh, having students working at the store, uh, interning uh, at the store, working part time at the store and working with the colleges really on this this great uh, launch business over this past year. Um, as Teresa mentioned, uh, after about 25 years or so uh, in corporate uh, banking and, and in the corporate world, uh, decided to leave and come back to Geneva because I love the weather in February, um, but also because it was a chance to come back and launch a new business. And I worked very closely uh, with some folks at Hobart William Smith, the entrepreneurial studies department to help me with the business plan uh, to really work at launching what you know, sometimes we refer to as the Amazon of the Finger Lakes. So in terms of some of the things you have in the gift box today, um, they're all sourced from the, uh, from the region and they're all sourced from small businesses. And that's where I got to meet Dan and, and the folks at Fox Run Vineyards because we're moving not only into wines, but Dan, and uh, one of his many things uh, he, he, he does, he makes uh, these brilliant wine staves with the names of the Finger Lakes on them. And in his woodworking business, and he's very talented in that regard, but came and launched this new business here and continue to work you know, with the colleges. And when uh, a few of the folks, including Teresa, came and said, look, we want to come up with an idea on how we can work together. We thought, why not do something social and something everyone likes to do, whether they were at Hobart William Smith uh, or at home uh, or now, and that's enjoy some wine and to really try to experience a bit of the, the Finger Lakes region. So tonight, as Teresa said, it's really meant to be casual and fun and, and also an educational experience. Um, so the taste itself, uh, as you'll hear from Dan, who I'll introduce in a minute, uh, he's gonna give a little bit of uh, history on wines here in the Finger Lakes, uh, certainly about how wine is made, and in particular, the two vintages of which we'll be trying later on. Um, and we'll see who finishes, finishes their bottle by the end of the program. There might be an award for that. Uh, I actually think we might have a few more than one winner. Um, but we'll, we'll be able to go through and learn a little bit about what we're tasting, actually how to pair it with, with different things, not just what, 
we're going to enjoy here, but but certainly other things that might be paired with wine. So definitely a fun learning experience. And for all of you, you certainly are familiar with the Finger Lakes region, spending you know your four years or uh, in some of my friends' cases, four years plus uh, time and enjoyably, I will say, uh, of the Finger Lakes region. And one of the cool things to recognize about this region is it's actually one of the top wine regions in the country, especially over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, it hosts more than 120 wineries and is actually the biggest producer of wine in, in New York State, if, if, if not the country, uh, second only to, to Napa Valley. Um, and you know it's a beautiful region where uh, some grapes in particular thrive, like the Riesling, one of which we'll have this evening, Chardonnays, Pinot Gris, uh, and others. And uh, I, I think what you'll find is as you explore this wine, uh, hopefully it opens the door to not only explore more wines from Fox Run, but more wines from the region. Um, just shifting it over a little bit into the wine tasting itself and, and introducing Dan. Dan is a part of Fox Run Vineyards. Uh, they actually have been producing a state wine since 1989. Uh, and they have been doing these virtual wine tastings quite a bit. Dan has been at the forefront of that uh, as he is a key part of Fox Run, been there since 2004. Uh, and he's responsible for all their, ex their distribution of the wines and, and doing these terrific wine tastings. Uh, he's a fountain of knowledge as you will hear uh, as we go throughout the, the program. So Dan and I are probably gonna chat you know, he'll do most of the talking, thankfully, from this point forward. I may interject a few things here or there. Um, but as Teresa said, we want to open this up to anyone who has any questions. Um, all you need to do is either raise your hand, unmute, or send us a little chat and, and we'll recognize you. And as Teresa said, please, let's treat this as a bit of a networking event too. I love the fact we have people from the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, in the last was 2000s, and, and parents on this, this, this call or on this Zoom. I can't think of a better way for folks to share a little bit of their, their time at Hobart William Smith and uh, say where they're from and the year that they were with. And, and if you have a story, tell the story for sure. Uh, just keep it clean, I guess, as it's being recorded, as Teresa said. Uh, so having said that, looking forward to enjoying this with everyone. Uh, and Dan, please take it away. Thanks, Jim, appreciate that. Um, one Quick thing off the bat, I want to, to correct real quick about what Jim said. I think he meant to say that the Finger Lakes as a whole are home to closer to 220 wineries. 220, that's right. Yep, yep. So among the 11 lakes of the Finger Lakes, uh, we've got well over 200 wineries and now 80 plus, if not 90 plus on Seneca Lake alone. So I'm going to make an assumption right off the bat that all of you are fairly familiar with the Finger Lakes and have spent time there. Maybe some of the parents in our group have spent a little less time there as they've dropped the kids on and off. Um, probably some of you dropped the kids off and took right off and went, went right back home. Kids are at college, I'm gonna head home. But if you spend some time in the Finger Lakes, hopefully you've gotten to know some of the wineries and tasted some of the wines. So um, as I said, the Finger Lakes as a whole is comprised of 11 lakes that span across the middle of the state. Um, glacially formed lakes. The last of those glaciers moved through the region about 12 and a half thousand years ago. And the glaciers and what they did to the region are the main reason that we grow grapevines here. So they did something really unique in the Finger Lakes. Um, they changed the direction of the water flow of all of upstate New York. So the last glacial movement that came through the region a little over 12 and a half thousand years ago, that sheet of ice was a mile thick as it came through the region. It went down to right about the Pennsylvania border and Jim's popped up my handy visual here. So that ice sheet came down from Canada, went down to just about the Pennsylvania border at the south end of, of the image you're seeing there. And as it receded, it did the final gouging out of the lakes. Um, and when it melted, it filled up those lakes. But what it did to the land is it left very high hills to the Southern Finger Lakes if you've been down to Watkins Glen and to Ithaca and seen the very high gorges and those beautiful trails that run through there, you can, you can recall that the Southern Finger Lakes are very, very steep and hilly, while the Northern Finger Lakes, where HWS is, are very low-lying areas. 
that glacier pushed all this land up high to the southern Finger Lakes, and as it moved north, it carved it out. When that glacier melted, it left pretty much everything in the screen that you're looking at here underwater for several thousands of years. Lake Ontario used to have a very large V in it that literally cut New York State in half. If you can see in the upper left-hand corner there where Rondecoit Bay is in Rochester, if you go southeast from Rondecoit Bay down those high hills along the 390 corridor down to Watkins Glen and back up through leather stocking country over to Mexico, New York, that's where a very large V had uh, a body of water shaped like a V had really cut New York State in half, made for a very fertile farming ground, which now is a majority of what that land does. But since those high hills are in the south and low lying ground to the north, a Finger Lake, by definition, feeds in the south and drains in the north. Um, that it, it absolutely reversed the water flow of the land that was here before that last glacier came through. So all 11 lakes feed in the south and drain in the north. It's the reason that things like Onondaga um, aren't a finger lake and the small ponds like Juanita and Lamoca aren't finger lakes. The one exception being Cuca Lake, the Y-shaped lake there, feeds in the south and in the north in Branchport and only drains in the north. So the water in Cuca Lake literally travels both north and south before it drains in the north end of the lake. Extremely unique body of water. So um, underwater currents, you had all of this land you're looking at was underwater for several thousands of years. Underwater currents are very good at mixing up your soil types. So you hear a lot about soil when you talk about wines and wine regions. Um, in very small plots of land, the farm at Fox Run Vineyards is a hundred acre plot of land. We have an, a tremendous amount of soil diversity on just our hundred acre plot. We have slate, silt, clay, sand, alternating layers of sand and clay in some regions. So we plant all of our grape varieties in multiple soil types. So depending on the hydrology of the growing season, the amount of rainfall we get, we get different aspects to our fruit. If it's a very wet year, the Riesling in the slate is gonna be quite a bit different than the Riesling in the sand. So soil diversity um, is one of our big strengths in the Finger Lakes and influence of the body of water. So Seneca Lake, as you know, very large body of water, about 38 miles long, about two and a half miles wide at its widest point, just shy of 650 feet deep. Only once in the 20th century did the entire surface area of the lake freeze, virtually never happens. So what this does is it moderates the temperatures on the surrounding hillsides and gives us warm breezes off the shore in the fall when the air temperature has dropped quickly and cool breezes off the shore in the spring when the air temperatures come up quickly which keeps the buds from coming out too early. So those are the protections we get from the body of water. Same reason they plant on the riverbanks in Europe, Long Island, Niagara Escarpment, um, other regions where their bodies of water is influence of that body of water. So that is a, a, a brief Snapchat of the geology, the history behind the geology of the Finger Lakes and part of what makes it a truly unique area um, for grape growing. Jim, you look like you have a question. I muted, which most people will probably appreciate, but I always have a question there, Dan. So I, I guess, and I know you're going to talk a little bit about other things in terms of the region itself, but I think in terms of how the region was formed, I'm just curious if there are other regions that would create that were similarly formed that would create a similar sort of uh, wine growing experience and produce a similar sort of wine to that of the Finger Lakes. And even one more step, what would you deem the, the opposite? Right. So if you're to look at the opposite of this region where, where wines produce, where would that be? Well, you know, somewhere very hot and dry <laughs> is probably the opposite. I mean, even even with the within the US, Napa and Sonoma are are pretty polar opposites to what we have in the Finger Lakes, while there is some overlap in grape varieties produced. Um, but there are so many differences to what makes a wine region unique and special and advantages, how they work with mother nature. I mean, really that's what everyone is doing in every wine producing region. How are you managing what mother nature gives you best in order to make quality wines? Obviously your, your super high elevations of some South American growing regions are gonna be very, very different than the Finger Lakes. Um, places where the, the hillsides are so steep that they, they have to farm everything by hand. They literally cannot use any mechanized um, harvesting or working the land at all. Similar regions 
um, can be a little difficult too because the land is different while the climate might be very similar. So uh, Finger Lakes is very often um, drawn a parallel to Austria and Germany. We grow a lot of the same grape varieties. We have a very similar climate to, to some regions of France as well, um, but still the land can be very different. So Germany is definitely where you're gonna hear most of your comparison to the Finger Lakes. Gotcha. Cool. So a pretty well-known German producer came to Seneca Lake um, a few years ago and um, opened up a, a vineyard down at the southern end of the lake on the eastern shore and had been growing in Germany for his family for hundreds and hundreds of years. But he came to the Finger Lakes and he met with many, many different Finger Lakes vineyard managers, he and his vineyard manager. And then he bought his plot of land and said, been doing it forever, I know what I'm doing and didn't listen to anything that the Finger Lakes vineyard managers told him and had a disastrous time planting his vineyard. He kept running into slate so thick they had to blast it apart, literally dynamite the ground in order to plant grapevines. And it took him twice as long and three times the cost to plant his vineyard. And um, his wines are, are spectacular, absolutely world-class, but why come to a region and talk to all the people who have been farming the ground since 1980 and then not do what they said? So that's just a good lesson in how you can come from one region and know it inside and out. You go to another region and not know it all. Um, we've had winemakers from California, from Napa, come to the Finger Lakes and have to spend at least two full harvests in the Finger Lakes relearning how to, and it's not relearning, but learning how to work this climate because it's so much different than uh, really anywhere in California. Oh, cool. So just to pause here, Dinks, I know we're gonna ship into, shift into the actual tasting uh, which is what everyone is really looking forward to sure. as well. Um, but just pause here, folks, and open it up to anyone who has any questions and love seeing a lot of friends and new faces on here, especially from 91, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, McRae there or Sam and Werner and Jim and Kate, all, the, all my great friends from 91 in particular, uh, but also others. But if anyone wanted to ask a question, John Insull, if, fellow fraternity brother from Phi Sig. Hey, John. Uh, but certainly if anyone wanted to ask any question at this point, um, please unmute your, your phone, go right ahead. Jim, should we, this is George Abraham, should we send them by chat or or actually what? I sent well, George, Dan a, I'll tell I you what, Dan you're on ask your question, chat. how's that? <laughs> oh, okay. I was wondering what, Dan, in terms of describing the Finger Lakes and their, how they formed there, you know, would you like to say anything about the salinity of Seneca Lake? Oh, that's a, that's a great question that really I don't, I, I don't know a whole lot about. Um, you're not allowed to pull water from the lake for farming purposes, so we don't use the water in the lake. Um, it's something that comes up every once in a while when people come to the region um, we're, we're what we call dry farmed. We're not irrigated and very few of your Finger Lakes wineries are irrigated because it's so less often the issue that we need to address. We typically have plenty of water. When we do run into drought stress, um, we bring water in and, you know, it comes in on a truck. We fill up a, a big tank and we literally hand water vines. I mean, we've got 50 acres of vines um, and you start with areas of the youngest vines, newest planted and um, ones that are in the shallowest soil um, are, are what you go through and you water first. You literally drive a tractor along with a wand and put two to three gallons a piece on every vine. Um, we're also certified as a lake friendly farmer. And that means that nothing that we do on our property um, has runoff that negatively affects the lake. And that's a certified from the state from soil and, and water conservation. So even though the, the lake is a, is a huge part of our farming and part of our life there, we never use the water for anything or really discuss how, how the lake is kind of on, a, on its own outside of its climatic effects. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't speak too much to the salinity of the lake. The, the, the lake sits underneath the lake is a Syracuse salt slab. Mm -hmm. And our, our geology department, HWS, I think, uh, I don't know whether they discovered it, but it leaks about 250,000 tons of salt into the lake a year. So the salinity of the lake is actually about a quarter to a third of that of what the ocean would be. Wow. To some extent, it keeps it from freezing. And of course, it modulates the temperature. And then because of the lake, there are thermoclines in it. And uh, those of us who have scuba, scuba dived on the lake, 
actually can go down 30 and feel a change of the temperature and the change in the clarity of the water from diving in it. And right. uh, every once in a while, it, circ it, it recycles, you know, and so the, the, uh, it keeps it from freezing. But I think that really gives something to, in terms of the stability of temperature of the lake, doesn't it? And the, thing, in the, uh, the, the way it modulates temperature in the region to some extent. Uh, definitely. The thermoclines without question do because you can, even in the coldest of winters, you go down about 15 feet and it's pretty close to 50 degrees through the entire year, in the high 40s anyway. Uh, I've never heard anyone, anyone um, speak to the potential of the salinity of the lake um, helping to keep, keep it from freezing. It certainly makes sense, um, but I've never heard anyone actually state that. So that's- Can I, uh, can I cut uh, in here as a geology major? <laughs> Please. <laughs> five. Actually, I, I, I want to. I want to. I want to disagree with that. Disagree with that. The salinity of the lake. The lake. I've got. We got an echo here. Well, the salinity is probably about three times most freshwater lakes. I would say about say 0.75 grams per liter, and the oceans on average are about 35 grams per liter. So it's about one fortieth. One fortieth. Probably. Oh very, very incrementally will affect the freezing temperature of the lake. So, that, so it's mostly that the lake is so deep that as the water cools and it hits the four degrees Celsius, which is the most dense, the highest density of water, it tends to circulate. And because the air is always moving because it's so long and circulating it, that it doesn't get a chance to freeze very often. So, but it's not so much the salinity as just the characteristics of the sure. lake being very deep. Yeah. And the, sure. Okay, the, 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 the fetch, or the, the wind being able to circulate it pretty much. Sure. And a large enough body of water that you've always got enough wind that there's wind movement at the surface. I mean, obviously, a very still lake is going to freeze over much quicker. So that's good. And this, I love this conversation. I've, I've learned quite a bit more just in this, these couple minutes here uh, than I've heard gleaning information from, uh, from over the years. So thank you very much for that. That's great. That's great. So, Dan, the... Um... What sort of minerals, like I get a lot of mineral in the Riesling and what, what's kind of the soil content that's going to impart that? So here's a, here's a topic that's really hotly debated and contested and gets discussed a lot that there is almost no science to back up. And that's the term minerality. What does minerality mean? Things like this. We do know that grapevines do not transport um, flavors from the soil. Grapevines do not pick up flavors from the soil. So a lot of people will say, you know, slate in the ground, slate in my glass. Hey, slate, slate, it makes sense. It doesn't work that way. Um, grapevines will create different flavors depending on the soil that they're in and the amount of rainfall they get in a year and how well they can produce the fruit. So the soil does have something to do with it um, but soil in the ground does not translate to flavors in the glass the way that some people want to think that they do. So slate is something that's commonly used for Riesling. It's a, a bracing acidity. It gives you, it's very palate cleansing. It gives you a kind of cool sensation on the palate as well. It's part of what makes Riesling so exciting and why winemakers really love to make Riesling. We get very diverse Riesling from our plots every year because we've got it in all of our soil types. We've got it in slate, we've got it in silt, we've got it in clay, we've got it in sand. So um, every year we get drastically different aspects to our Riesling. We did a line of Rieslings for several years called the Geology Series, where we harvested on the same day, in the same conditions, at almost the exact same bricks, Riesling from the slate and from the clay, fermented them the same way and got different Rieslings. And it was uh, a bit, our, our winemaker is very much a science-based winemaker. And he wanted to kind of break down all of this minerality, this terroir, all of this. He's not as big of a proponent of terroir as having a huge effect on the wine because he says, you know, great winemakers or bad winemakers can screw up great fruit. Like a winemaker has almost an unlimited amount of decisions that the winemaker can make, they're going to steer that wine in a different direction. So while terroir is part of it, um, the winemaking certainly has a lot to do with it as well. So slates are, or uh, minerality is a tricky one, especially right now. It's come up a lot recently in the last 
you know, six months to a year, you can find a ton of articles out there about minerality and it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of a hot topic at the moment, really. So do you blend from the different soil types generally? You just blend it all together or? Uh, well, not, not generally blend it all together, but so we have more Riesling planted than any other grape variety, which is probably true for most Finger Lakes wineries of your 200 plus Finger Lakes wineries. I think all but two make at least one style of Riesling. We have made up to 11 Rieslings and one vintage before at Fox Run Vineyards. So the fruit will come in, uh, our winemaking team will evaluate the juice and put it in tank and then ferment it in a variety of ways. A few different yeast strains, different temperatures. They will stop, um, some of them will stop the fermentation very early and keep a lot of sweetness in the juice so they can use it as a blending component. So they don't have to add sugar. If they wanted a, a Riesling to be a touch sweeter later, they can just add uh, juice that's a little bit sweeter. And then the winemakers would start paring down the Rieslings from there. They'll find their reserve Riesling if there is one. Then they'll find, you know, obviously their single vineyard Rieslings. Then they'll do the dry Riesling. And then the balance of everything else uh, will end up in the semi-dry Riesling, which is our largest production Riesling. So Dan, why don't we, why don't we do this, Dan, and everyone? Uh, we're about 30 minutes in. And I know that I'm ready to have a drink. And actually, I've cheated. I've had a couple, but uh, I mean a couple of sips. <laughs> so why don't we get started with the first, uh, the first wine? There are three or four questions asked from from some from, from some folks. We'll introduce those in a, in a bit as well. Um, okay. Let's get to one of the tastings. Sure. So Riesling, as I mentioned, is is kind of king in the Finger Lakes for vinifera for European grape varieties. Pretty much everyone makes a Riesling. It is probably most wineries' number one selling wine. Uh, although at Fox and Vineyards, ours happens to be the unoaked Chardonnay is our number one selling wine, kind of unique. Um, and we have a variety of Rieslings at Fox Run that run from absolutely bone dry, no discernible residual sugar. And that's about 0.4, four grams per liter of, of sugar is the threshold for what you can taste the sweetness right up through dessert wine sweet. We don't do a late harvest, but we do some um, Auschwitz style, German style Rieslings that are much sweeter with lower alcohol. Um, so there is a Riesling out there for every taste. For the most part, if someone says they don't like Riesling, I say you haven't found the Riesling that you like. There's a difference between the two because it's very diverse wine and very, uh, very good food pairing wine. So the one that we have here is our Sylvan Riesling. Um, and the term Sylvan, um, if you've uh, heard, you may have heard it in other applications, Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, Transylvania, of the woods or across the woods. Sylvan means of the woods. So this is an oak fermented Riesling as opposed to most Rieslings which are done in 100% stainless steel. So the very first three weeks of fermentation are done in large format neutral oak barrels which kind of gives the palate of the wine a little bit more breadth and it's a touch fat on the palate. Um, if you hold this wine on your palate and let it warm up with the acids in the wine warm up, they're really going to change your perception and you'll get quite a bit of diversity and flavor if you'll hold it on your palate for a few seconds as well. It is a dry style Riesling for sure, but still has quite a bit of fruit character. It's something that a lot of people um, mistake. They say that fruity means sweet. You can be absolutely bone dry and be fruity. Jim has transported himself somewhere else there for a second. Jim, are you going to become a cat lawyer on us? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Sam, you're right. I am not a cat and I am not a storefront. So what are the general thoughts about uh, the Riesling? I know a lot of people steer away from Rieslings because they assume they're always sweet. And in reality, the majority of the Rieslings in the world, in, uh, produced in the world are dry. The ones that are mass produced, widely distributed, and very easy to find tend to be sweeter style Riesling. So you kind of have to go searching for the drier styles. So any thoughts or questions about the Riesling? Dan, would you say the Riesling is the most wide ranging grape? I mean, you made reference, if you can't find a Riesling, then you know you, you really haven't tried hard enough, but uh, is it the most range, wide ranging grape? I, I feel without question, and I think most winemakers would agree, 
with that as well. The only other grape variety where you have almost as much uh, expanse from dry to sweet and a finished product is Gewürztraminer, but Gewürztraminer has completely different flavors and characters and it's very polarizing wine and it's something different altogether. Winemakers love to make Riesling. It shows their style and their skill very, very well. You can't hide anything, especially in a dry Riesling, you can't hide anything in there. So it has to be clean, it has to be well-made. Let me paraphrase a question for you, Dan. Um, John Insull asked uh, a question about microclimates and if they exist in the region. If so, does it affect the Riesling grape? Does it affect other types of grapes or is there no effect at all if there are no microclimates? There are definitely, especially being on a body of water like Seneca Lake, there are microclimates. A lot of the microclimate effect that I've seen over the years up and down the lake is amount of rainfall in a growing season can be very different as these clouds move over the Finger Lakes and over the bodies of water, land temperature different than water temperature, the clouds break up and you get these smaller cells that move around and uh, we can get drastically different rainfall than Anthony Road gets, which is just two miles to the south of us. Um, and microclimate can apply as well to uh, what hillside, how, how's your hillside facing? Is it you know, east or west facing? Does it get the morning sun? Do you get longer hours of sunlight? If you're in the west, you tend to get a little bit more sunlight. On the east, it's nice because we get the morning sun an hour, hour and a half earlier. So on those spring days where we've had a real cold overnight temperature, we're coming out of the frost zone about an hour and a half earlier than Silver Thread directly across the lake from us. So that can have its advantages as well. So yeah, microclimate is definitely a thing in the Finger Lakes. Terrific. Have another question have there? Question there. Yeah. On your uh, bottle, you said there's, you have an unorthodox way of approaching Riesling. What do you mean by that? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, our winemaker is a very unorthodox winemaker in the first place, um, but the, that's referencing this particular Riesling, the oak fermented Riesling. Um, it is less commonly seen, certainly in American Rieslings. It's fairly unusual. I can think of maybe 10 or so in all the Finger Lakes. Uh, there's a German region that does it on a pretty regular basis, um, but for American Rieslings, being oak fermented is the unorthodox winemaking um, practice there. So Dan, in terms of what we have here from a pairing perspective, maybe chat a little bit about you know, what Rieslings typically pair with, uh, what they don't pair with very well, and maybe if there's something with regard to what we have here, uh, chat a little bit about uh, how to basically, how the, the wine affects what it is that we're gonna nosh on a little bit. Sure, so Rieslings inherently, loads and loads of acidity, and being from a cool climate, you have loads of acidity as well. So grapes start out the growing season, very, very high in tartaric acid. Mother Nature converts that tartaric acid to sugar as the growing season goes on. In a cool climate like this, we end up with a moderate sugar level. So in Rieslings, it might be 19 to 21 bricks, 19 to 21% sugar. You go to a very warm region um, and their sugar levels tend to be much higher because Mother Nature has given them tons of sun and they've, she's converted all of that um, tartaric acid into sugar. Uh, I was out in Temecula a few years ago and got a chance to chat with winemaker and taste through some Rieslings that were in fermentation. And he said, well, I don't really care for this Riesling. It only came in at 24 bricks. And I practically dropped my glass and spit my wine out. Uh, but always knowing that a winemaker knows far more about it than I do, I waited until I got back to my car and I called Peter Bell and I said, what, what's going on here? And he said, the winemaker is not wrong. It's just an indicator that they probably shouldn't do Riesling in that area there in that hot climate, they need to get to 24, 25 bricks to hit full flavor development. In a cool climate where we have drastic difference between our daytime temperatures and our overnight lows, it advances flavor development while keeping a loads of acidity in the fruit. So we can make world-class Rieslings at 18 bricks. Um, you would never see a uh, Riesling in the Finger Lakes at 22 and a half or up would be really unheard of. So, um, that's, I, I forget now where I started with that, but that's <laughs> with Rieslings, 
huge amount of diversity in styles and winemaker styles, but for the most part across the region, we're looking for about, you know, 19 to 21 bricks at harvest in these wines. So for pairing, acidity is where that was. We got loads, Mother Nature leaves us with loads and loads of acidity, which is great for food pairing. Acid cleanses your palate, cleans off things that are fat and rich, and gets you ready for your next bite of food. So cheeses, obviously cheeses, butter dishes, um, you know, some meats that are just naturally a little fat on the palate and savory. Nice, nicely done, Jim. Um, are going to uh, are going to work. <laughs> are going to work well with Riesling. Super dynamic food pairing wine. There are even some examples um, of Rieslings that you could have. Um, with beef dishes, if it's an Asian um, beef dish, a stir fry, something like that with beef, certainly would go very well with Riesling. So Dan, when, when we're trying this uh, Asiago cheese crisp, for example, right, um, and we taste the wine, what's happening basically to the palate as we do this? And how do you think, or how does this in particular, this crisp or anything affect the palate in the wine? And why is it important to pair with certain things like crisps or meats or cheeses? Right. Again, um, wine and cheese is a pairing that everyone loves to do, and it makes sense. And most people like to have wine with their cheese. In the strictest rules of food and wine pairing, they're both they're supposed to complement each other, right? is your best pairing. It's very rare to find a cheese that complements the wine. It's almost always one directional where your wine is helping your cheese experience and not going the other way around. So while everyone does it, we love to do it. It's not in the, the best, not the strictest guideline of a great food and wine pairing. In the world of food and wine pairings, 80% of your food and wine pairings work just fine. 10% are outstanding where you have that complementary nature and 10% are bad food and wine pairings and things you don't want to do again. So People shouldn't get too concerned about a food and wine pairing or too stressed out about how it's going to go because you have an overwhelming chance of being just a, a perfectly fine pairing. Here you've got just a touch of, of heat in these, just a little bit of hint of spice, which Riesling is always great at counteracting a little bit of spice in food. But one of your classic pairings is something with some heat to it. You want a little bit sweeter style. You want a semi-dry, medium sweet Riesling to go with it. Sweetness counteracts heat. Perfect. And what, I'll tell you, in, in sort of preparing for this and deciding what else we should include, the cheese crisp that I just tried with this certainly did open up the wine for me quite a bit and, and alter the taste nicely, I thought. Um, I got a lot of suggestions about what it is we should be pairing with or could have been pairing with. And so as I'm sort of thinking about this, one of the folks asked, hey, we know Cam's Pizza. What kind of cheese? Is this the sort of cheese that will go with this wine? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of folks would certainly recognize that current and past alike. Cam's has been certainly a mainstay for folks, usually late night, maybe after the holiday or, or sideshow or, or any of the other places, or even during the, the day if they're on, wanting to escape the saga or something. So I actually again, just, I just, at lunch, just at lunch today, I burned the roof of my mouth on a slice of Cam's pizza. <laughs> just today. No, that's terrific. Uh, so good. So, uh, Dan, while we're doing this, just another, you know, question uh, that came from the floor and then we can uh, just move it forward a little bit here. But uh, just about climate change in the impact on growing grapes here. Cheryl Heineman or Cheryl Allen, uh, good friend from 91, asked the question, has climate change affected the, 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 the wine here? And how? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Anyone who doesn't believe in climate change should go to a grape growers convention and you will run into just a absolute unanimous crowd of people that can give you stories about how things have changed quite a bit for us. So being a cooler climate and shorter growing season region, um, a little bit higher temperatures and some changes to the growing season are not going to be where we see as much of an effect. Uh, if anything, that might put us in a, a better position to expand some, to maybe plant more Syrah or things that need more heat and a longer growing season. Uh, at the moment, very little Syrah grown in Finger Lakes. Uh, where we do see an issue is inconsistency in our winters. Um, so we need 
Grapevines need to shut down, they need to hit a dormant temperature, and they need to stay that cold for quite a while in order to be protected in the spring when it's time to wake up. If we don't get a long enough and cold enough winter, um, they don't develop the grape, the winter hardiness that we need to ensure a safe spring and coming out of those temperatures. So grape, some grape varieties where we have really seen that uh, is with Merlot quite a bit. And we're not a region known for Merlot anyway, but it does have a flaw to it in that in the spring, um, when you get probably two to three days of temperatures that start to get up into the 50s, you get soft tissue. You get, uh, um, it starts to get soft and get um, susceptible to winter damage in just two to three days. And then you get a cold snap and you kill your Merlot vines. Cabernet Sauvignon probably takes seven to 10 days of that steady temperature of about 50 degrees or above to get that kind of soft tissue. So we lose Merlot at a rate that's probably, you know, five times higher than we lose Cab Soft because we're not getting, you know, en enough winter, uh, a long enough winter, or we're getting warm snaps in the middle of winter. Dan, one of the things, and also suggested here, that's a terrific answer. Cheryl, hopefully that, that nailed it for you. Very informative, for sure. Uh, I saw one of the things in the comments about what doesn't pair well with wine. And uh, one thing's for sure, and many of you will recognize this, some of you won't in the more recent years, but anyone who basically uh, was here in the 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, uh, the Twin Oaks doesn't pair well with wine. Uh, the Twin Oaks is a famed watering hole just now where the Hobart and William Smith sign is. Uh, today, welcome you to the campus, beautiful sign, but the oak sat there for years and lots of folks would go and enjoy probably not wines uh, there. Um, I know growing up, just a quick side story, I actually had my first drink there, my first beer there, uh, and I was in eighth grade. Uh, so they definitely like to serve them young there. Anyway, Dan, I, th I saw that from Scott Mason and I already had the picture up there because figured I'd have a way to interject it at some, some point, but Scott, you set it up perfectly. <laughs> and I see someone says he and a wife. By met the way, there. John Insull and his wife met there. How cool is that? I would want to say too a, a welcome, um, Carrie and John. I'm not going to say it right, but Hilkema, you have parents, and your parents are Josh, and he's a senior, and it's your first Zoom meeting, and you're seeing lots of great folks here from lots of let's just say Hobart William Smith generations, and hopefully what you're seeing uh, is really just how. Many of the folks here from throughout the decades, throughout the classes, love to join in with stuff like this. And hopefully you'll get to see and hear how, you know, we experience lots of cool and different things that spark a lot of great memories. So uh, welcome. Okay, Dan, do we want to shift over? To the sure. Next one? Um, what you can do real quick before you abandon your Riesling is you can try it with the pepperoni as well. Oh. Um, while you've got a few options in front of you, always nice when you got a, a couple wines and a few options in front of you is to try to gauge what you feel is a good or a bad food and wine pairing. When, remember when someone recommends a food and wine pairing to you, their tastes are probably very different than your tastes. So you're taking them at their word, but you might like something you know, different as well. So with the fatness in that um, pepperoni, pepperoni, uh, what was I saying? Yep, pepperoni, um, the, the acidity and the Riesling is gonna help clean that off the palate as well. So probably the Riesling would pair just fine with both of those. Our next wine, the Lemberger, a dry red wine is going to go with the pepperoni. The Lemberger probably would go with all three of these options. It's one of the nice things about cool climate reds being that they are um, lower in uh, alcohol. So since we have less sugar at harvest, that lower bricks, we have less byproduct, which is alcohol. So a lot of your cool climate reds come in at about 12 to 13, maybe 13 and a half percent alcohol, but you don't get 14s and 15s out of reds out of a cool climate. Also important to remember that when a wine label tells you what the alcohol is, the government gives us a one and a half percent wiggle room of the actual alcohol based on what it says on the label. Um, the equipment to test alcohol is very expensive and most wineries don't have it. We don't have it. Um, so if a wine says 12 and a half percent and you add one and a half above and beyond that, that takes you 11 to 14% alcohol, which is your, um, your guideline for table wine. So the term table wine is strictly a tax designation for the winery. That's all the term table wine means is how much tax we pay the government on the wine. So if it's 11 to 14%, we pay one rate. 
If it's over 14%, we pay a higher rate per gallon. So a lot of wineries, especially small wineries where costs are, are everything to us, will use the term table wine wherever we can. Um, a lot of, uh, it's not true for all alcoholic beverages, no. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, your California wineries won't use the term table wine because they're charging you 40, 50, 90, hundred dollars for a cab. And someone would say Cadillac economy car. Well, this doesn't make any sense. And chances are they're above 14% alcohol anyway. So the only thing that the term table wine means is how much tax we pay on it. But again, in a cool climate, um, well, most of our alcohols are below 14% anyway. So cool climate reds, moderate alcohol, soft tannin, because we don't use a lot of new oak. In fact, at Fox Run, our reds never see any new oak. Um, we take a tremendous amount of pains to develop these fruit flavors through the growing season. And, um, and why do we want to bury them under a ton of barrels to give barrel flavor? We want barrel influence. We want palate weight. We want complexity, but we don't want barrel flavors. We want to maintain our fruit. So we're really well known for um, our Lemberger at Fox Run Vineyards. We grow more than anyone else, uh, potentially in the U.S. at seven and a half acres. Lemberger is the German name for the grape variety. The Austrian name is Blaufrankisch, exact same grape variety. Um, the Hungarian name is Kekfrankos. It has about 60 other names above and beyond that, depending on where it's from. Most of your Eastern European countries grow some form of this grape variety, um, exact same grape, but it's called many, many different things. Lemberger is known for a distinct black pepper character. Same thing that gives um, Zinfandel and Syrah their black pepper character is in Lemberger. It's a component that's right in the skins of the grape. Um, and actually, if you pull it off the vine and macerate the a grape in your teeth, macerate the skins, you can taste the black pepper right off the vine as well. So that black pepper makes for a really unique, some unique food pairing options as well. If we have a cooler growing season, we get more black pepper, but a little less body to the wine. If you have a hot, dry season, and a longer season, that black pepper component matures out of the fruit and you'll get subtle black pepper, but a lot more depth. The nice thing is unlike a Merlot, which can have very good and bad growing season, Lemberger, whether it's a cool year, a hotter, drier year, you get nice Lemberger, they're just different in those years, but there's not a good and bad. You never get the green bell pepper character that you can get in Cap Franc. You don't get you know, some of these other things in a, in a cooler or wetter year. And it ages like a champ too. We're still opening all ones and all twos now that, that age absolutely beautifully. Dan, one quick side in terms of Finger Lakes wines. It, it seems to me, right, when you think of French wines, for example, and people talk about, oh, that's a 72 whatever, right? Or, you know, an 82 for whatever, right? Uh, I certainly know in terms of Hobart William Smith people, the older we get, the better we get. But how is that compared with Finger Lakes wines? Uh, is that typical? Do they age typically? I don't see a lot that go that far back. So the, if, if you're not already aware of this, there's probably no other component in our day-to-day -day lives, no other uh, item in our day-to-day -day lives that's filled with more BS than wine is because the marketing department has gotten a hold of everyone and just told them all of these beautiful, flowery, wonderful things that come out of the marketing department that don't have any practical vineyard application. So um, one of those obviously is you know, the older the wine, the better. You hear that in some, some areas. Um, Rieslings uh, age absolutely wonderfully depending on the style and depending on the vintage. Um, reds, again, depending on the grape variety, depending on the vintage, depending on how the winemaker made that wine. You can make it to age or you can make it to drink now. So I'm really hard pressed to find any wine related question where the answer isn't, it depends. I mean, it, it really does. It depends on so many different factors. So I have aged Lemberger from, you know, as far back as 01 and 02 in cooler years and in hot, dry years, and they both tend to age really well. Dry Rieslings, um, I tend to only age in the cooler years, not the hot, dry years. You only want to age uh, dry Rieslings from cooler vintages, and semi-dries can age beautifully in both hot or cool vintages. And a quick thing here, right? And I think for everyone, and, and this is terrific, and, and the conversation is great, the questions and loving following the chats and, and, and comments from folks in particular. Um, 
So we're, we're about eight minutes to the hour. Uh, as long as it's cool, you know, everyone will go a little bit after. Um, if folks have more questions, which I'm, I'm seeing them in there. And, and by the way, Pete Wasserman, there is no way to slow down if you drink wine too fast, at least that I'm aware of. So if anyone else has a suggestion for Pete, please, please let them know or let all of us know. Um, but, but I guess, and just as a side there, folks, if you need to drop off, clearly drop off. Uh, and one message all the way, uh, by the way, from Hobart William Smith is, as, uh, as we heard in the very beginning from Teresa, uh, a lot of couples are here. It's Valentine's Day weekend. It's one of the weirdest years, uh, or at least with COVID that any of us have ever experienced. That's probably been over said. Yes, Stan, but I think from, and on behalf of and from Hobart William Smith, just sending out Valentine's love uh, to everybody for this weekend and, and the love for everyone to, to join us uh, for this. So quick message there from Hobart William Smith as well with regard to the weekend. And the fact we've got a few more minutes here on the clock uh, and certainly uh, any more questions, please, please throw them out there. Or uh, if anyone wants to share a story uh, with regard to their wine experiences in the Finger Lakes, certainly share that as well. I've seen a few questions about the Lemberger come up on the, the chat. If anyone wants to, to go ahead and speak up and ask that question. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> If any un unmuted person wants to speak up, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll ask the question: uh, Among all your beautiful reds, why did you choose the Lamberger tonight? Um, it's it's a pretty diverse uh, food pairing wine, and one that I think needs more awareness and attention. Um, and again, one that we're really well known for it at Fox Run. It's seven and a half acres of estate grown Lamberger. We grow close to two acres more than anyone else in the Finger Lakes. And the only other area where they grow much in the United States is in Washington state. They grow quite a bit as well. So it's always, um, I, I've had several years where in the New York City metro market, my Lemberger uh, is pretty much every year, actually come to think of it, every year since 2010 uh, that we've been in the metro New York City market, my Lemberger outsells my Rieslings in that market. So really oh. unique for a Finger Lakes winery to have. Um, in fact, the last couple of years, my Cab saw have outsold my Rieslings as well. So uh, it's just nice to show a lot of people have, you know, preconceived notions about Finger Lakes Reds or Cool Climate Reds in general. It's just nice to show them, you know, real strong wine that we're, we're well known for. Now this is, uh, it's interesting because um, as you might hear from my accent, I'm French. And when I first tasted the Lamberger in the, in the Finger Lakes quite a few years ago. I could not drink it. And this is the, yours is the first Lamberger that I truly like. I mean, okay, it's the great. first time I actually really like it. There's not too much mushroom. It's not too peaty, you know, literally, sure. which is some, right. what some of those were. And uh, no, this one is really a very balanced wine. I, I love it. I'm surprised. Good. I have to admit. <laughs> I, <laughs> I gotta say, she doesn't like the PD scotches either, the PD yeah. whiskey. Right. And, and, and I have another motto for the Finger Lakes wines: We're ready. <laughs> We're ready. Yes. Yes. I think, well, I think, and we are. And we are. Yes. Yes. Thank also, you, thank you so much. Also, bear in mind that um, you know we when we produce wines, we're dealing with Mother Nature. She's very. It takes her a long time to teach her lessons, and she's very ruthless when she does. So it can take a producer 10, 12 years to really dial in how to learn their plot of land, what clone they've got in it, their soils, and work, learn how to work all of these things. So it does take quite a bit of time to learn how to do these things. Hi. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is Todd Rosenthal and my wife, Betsy, we're from the class of 71 and 72, even though our name says Teresa Gage underneath our picture Sorry. there. Sorry. <laughs> Most people uh, do. <laughs> when, we were, when we were at school, uh, obviously, Genesee Cream Ale was the big drink, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it still is. Uh, it still is? Utica Club. <laughs> You see, yeah, yeah, which and we love the oaks, which we used to call something else. But in any case, um, <laughs> the uh, only wineries at Finger Lakes are Lake Niagara. Is that right? Was yeah. around in those days. 
Taylor. Uh, Taylor? Wid Widmer. Taylor and Widmer made, were known for the Lake Niagara wines. Yep. Yep. And then I, you know, it was in 70, 71 or, or 71, 72, you know, you had very few choices of local wines. And then my daughter, yep. grad, my daughter graduated in 2000, she's 11. 2011. And, you know, we would go up and visit her and she would just take us, you know, down, down South Main Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just wonderful. It's just fabulous. So we met each other there. Our daughter met her husband there. And they gave us this as a yeah. Valentine's Day. Yeah, this was a Valentine's Day oh. present from them. So Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. And you, you're doing a great job. We just wanted to say hi and, and correct the fact that and we're, 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 we're not Teresa Gray. <laughs> and you guys did a really good job at their wedding three and a half years ago. We had the um, night before there and uh, reception. And the food was fabulous, but the wine was amazing. And... Yeah, it was Glenn in a, Burger is is our favorite. Yeah, it was and in an old building uh, in down, no, down right in downtown in the, Geneva, I think. No, it was in the winery. At, at down Fox below. Is the barn, the barn yep. at Fox Road Vineyards. Yep. Oh barn, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. It was great. But can the you barn was can built people? From, yeah, can people from out of state um, get the? Uh, I know my daughter and her husband live in D.C. and they get the. Um, wine uh sent to them like if yeah, they're if, if signed up our, if they go to our website they can get it shipped direct we don't currently have a distributor in dc so they're not going to find it at their local wine store but they can use the fox run website and get it shipped direct yep. okay and we could do that too here yes. in, we're in connecticut uh yep yep you can we never can find finger lakes wine here yeah, and, and well, you've uh, Dr. Frank does pretty well in Connecticut. Red Newt does pretty well in Connecticut. Um, there are there are a few that do do okay there, but not many. If you guys okay. have a, well, have a thank Wegmans you. near you, they do because we're Virginia DC. If you have a Wegmans that you carry some box run, not all of it, but you can find it there. Yes, uh, the, 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 Wegmans, the Wegmans, Wegmans in Virginia, is, uh, off ninety five south of DC, they've got <laughs> quite a bit of. Uh, they got some, mostly what I've seen there is like salmon run from Dr. Frank, but there's some Finger Lakes wines in that Wegmans. Yeah, pretty much system wide, anywhere a Wegmans sells wine, you can find Fox Run in it because they do their own distribution. We don't have to have a distributor in, you know, DC. The Wegmans trucks take it from, from one warehouse to another. Hey, Dan, this is, we're, we're in New Hampshire. I have a freshman daughter. Do you, do you know if you're in with the New Hampshire distributors and New Hampshire liquor stores? Because we have this weird sort of state monopoly on the sales of wine. Yep, you do. It's in weird, weird is one descriptor for it. Um, we have a couple of Finger Lakes wineries that do really well in New Hampshire. Dr. Frank, it's one of their largest markets outside of New York State. Um, we were never, I was never able to get FaceTime with the board in New Hampshire and it just it kind of fell off my radar, especially in the last year and change. So I know that you can get some, um, but uh, again, the largest uh, presence of any Finger Lakes winery in New Hampshire, I'm pretty sure is Dr. Frank. Thank you. That's yep. great. So we're just at the top of the hour here and, and there are lots of other great questions here. And uh, I think people, as the wine is settling in, the alcohol level, I'm going to suggest might be north of that 12% there, Dan. Maybe it's just me. Well, but, look, uh, so I, and I should state that um, on ours, uh, since we distribute these wines in Europe, where they don't allow the wiggle room in alcohol, ours are labeled with the actual alcohol. So when you go to your store, if you see the number, the alcohol percentage on a bottle, and in a 0 0.0 or a 0 0.5, there's, there may be a pretty good chance that that's a wiggle room alcohol. If you see it end in, if you pick up the back of the Sylvan, it says 12.3. If it ends in anything other than 0 0.0 or 0.5, they've probably had it analyzed and figured out the actual alcohol for that wine. Didn't know that. That's actually fascinating. It's a, it's a best guess. I mean, you can't like this one. This one says 13 and it is 13 because sometimes that's just where it ends up. How much do you sell to Europe? Uh, not a ton, but it's nice to be available. And uh, Europeans actually really like Finger Lakes wine. Europeans don't like California wine. It is um, too high in alcohol. It's overripe. It's concentrated. It's 
you know, a ton of barrel use. There's no, there's not many um, uh, European analogs for, for a lot of California style of winemaking. So we're in a collective with a few other Finger Lakes wineries and we might send pre-COVID, you know, in 2018, 2019, 17, 18, 19, between us and a few other Finger Lakes wineries, we were probably sending three containers a year to, uh, to Northern Europe mostly. So may, maybe- May I add something here? Um, every time I go to Europe, I bring Finger Lakes wine as presents to everybody. And people are first amazed, surprised because they've never heard of it. And then they always, always love it. Great. Always, always appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I got an opportunity two to three years ago to pour our Lemberger and three other Finger Lakes wineries Lembergers at the Austrian wine festival where they were doing a focus tasting on Blau Frankish, of course is what they call it. And we were absolutely flooded. It was a two hour tasting and I couldn't step away from a bottle of wine for two full hours because no one had a chance, had ever known in New York, they grew the grape variety, let alone a chance to taste. We had 16 of them on the table and we just, we were swamped for two straight hours. So uh, Europeans are, are, are pretty fascinated and complimentary of Finger Lakes wines. So, so Dan anybody, and everyone. Oh. Sorry, anybody who knows anything about the history of wine in Europe knows that the grapes in, in Europe are mostly coming from uh, originally from, uh, from New York State. Well, the rootstock anyway. Yeah. The rootstock, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Root, yeah. Root. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And this is something that's a little known fact. And when you, you explain this to people in Europe that actually this comes in New York, uh, yes, right. <laughs> it's a nice little thing to add. <laughs> so do they roll their eyes a little bit when they hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I know we're at the, at the end here, Dan, and just to say thank you, but what I want to do before we sort of brought this thing to a close is raise a glass, not only to you, Dan, and thanking you for this, but also to all of my friends, new friends, uh, here on the call from, from Hobart William Smith to thank you for joining, to toast 2021 and to each other and to not only having more of these, but at some point, let's also do this together, hopefully here at, in beautiful Geneva in the campus of Hobart William Smith. So cheers to everyone. Cheers. Thank you.